Hi, everyone. Welcome back to episode 18 of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Today's guest is Simon Morn. Simon grew up in Whitley Bay in the northeast of England. He eventually found his way to Japan in 1995. He worked for a small English school until 1998 and then started out on his own. He started his franchising business in 2003, and at the time of recording, he has 12 schools in Japan. He is also a blogger and an author, and some of his websites are happyvalley.tv and modernenglish.net. I had a great chat with Simon about the options for entrepreneurs in franchising. Hey, everyone. Buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit EFLMagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. Okay, so uh, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Uh, today, I'm delighted to have Simon Morn. And Simon is the CEO, founder at Modern English, and he's an entrepreneur creator. Um, he also is a publisher for, for Happy Valley, and he's a franchisor, um, and he's he's a blogger. Uh, he, to be honest, he's got a lot of things going on, Simon. So I really... Really looking forward to having a chat with him. How are you today, Simon? Um, uh, I'm good. Thanks, Philip. Thanks for having us on. Um, finally got around to talk to you. Sorry, I've been uh, putting you off so many times up till now. But um, No problem. Ple- pleased to finally be here. Looking forward yeah, to it. Yeah, I'm pleased, pleased to meet you. You're in Osaka. Is that right? I actually live in Kyoto, but uh, oh. the, of- the office is in Osaka. I live up in the, in the hills in uh, Kyoto, quite near to Nara. And um, drive into the office, which is in Hirakata in Osaka. Yeah. Okay. And mm. I suppose I'll go back to the the beginning. You, I, I'm having a look at your blog. So your blog right. is just to kind of name track these things is Morin actually. So your name is. Uh, we had a little chat about this before. <laughs> the your name is Morin, not Moran. Morin. Yeah, yeah, it's more it's Morin actually. Yeah. So obviously coming from uh, England, I'm from Whitley Bay near Newcastle in northeast of England. Coming from England. Um, it's more common to say Moran, so that's what people say. So that's been my stock response ever since I went to school, really. Mm. It's more, it's more than actually. And, um, <laughs> you know, you can, uh, it's, it's fine, completely fine for people um, not to know how to, how to say it. But so that's more than actually that, that comes from me saying, actually, it's more than. Mm. So you can imagine how that goes sometimes. But uh, yeah, it's more than actually dot com readers. Okay. And I'm just having a look at it here. You have a, you have a, Background in blogging, I believe you were in. Was it uh, Time Out Kansai? Kansai uh, Time Out, yeah. So actually, yes. actually, actually, more of a background. Uh, Part time freelance journalism. Um, I started writing for the Kansai Time Out in 1998, I think, and I was a contributor and then um, Osaka correspondent. Um, I edited the travel section, the uh, Japan travel section. And then was associate editor for a while and was involved with a Kansai timeout for, well, from 1998 until it folded, which was, I think, 2009. And it was great. It was, uh, I had a lot of fun doing that, made a lot of good friends. It was, you know, it was only sort of part-time freelance, but I've also written for uh, The Guardian, The Japan Times, uh, Mojo, 442, and most importantly, Scootering Magazine, which is a great magazine about scooters. Oh, I see. Okay, so is it fair to say you you've you've kind of got the mod background? Is that is that your mod, musical? modern English? Yeah. You might have noticed mm. there are targets on everything that I do. Yeah, and so I wrote an article uh, initially for the Kansai Timeout, but um, uh, rewrote it for Scootering.com. I wrote an article mm. about mods in Japan and mm. their scooters, which they spend uh, a lot of money on. Um, I, I know a guy who paid like a million yen for a refurbished Lambra. Really? Yeah. Wow. I don't know if you know much about scooters, but I know a little bit. I had a, I have a friend living in Korea, and he's uh, he was a mod or is a mod. I, yeah. But, I think, but actually, you know, I've seen his Facebook profile, and he now has a 
motorbike. So oh, has, no. he, has he changed? He, what, he's, what gone happened? Over, he's gone over at the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a very interesting point, though. You say mm. there was a mod, is a mod, corrected yourself very quickly because mm. I, don't, I, don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's something that leaves you. I'll be buried in mod. In fact, I've written specific instructions for the suit that I'll be buried in, which mm. is one that I had Taylor made. Um, but <laughs> I, I, but I'm, not, I'm not sure this is the direction you want to take the podcast. No, but no, no, no. Just, Please, uh, it, it is interesting, and and because it, it kind of leads on to Whitley Bay. Yeah. You know, what we think of mods and rockers, was it a Brighton Beach? Brighton was Beach, there yeah. mods and rockers rumbling yeah. on Whit in Whitley Bay? There certainly was. Mm. Um, the there always used to be scooter rallies, uh, like bank holidays, and uh, the scooter rallies used to come down to to Whitley Bay. This would have been when I was a teenager, sort of early eighties. Uh, scooters were also ridden by psychobillies, so you had this kind of interesting mix of mods, skinheads, and psychobillies. And uh, yeah, there'd be and then there'd be a bit of violence. You know, uh, we used to go down. Whitley Bay, for those that don't know, is a seaside town. So it has a fun fair or had a fun fair and amusement arcades around it. So we used to go down there dressed as mods and, and in our parkers. And we used to get attacked by skinheads. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been in fights because I was a mod. It's quite bizarre. I've run away from more fights than I've been in, I have to say, because um, that's the first thing that you need to do, I think, is avoid violence rather than get involved in it. But mm. um, Yeah, and just a quick thing on on this, would it be fair to call it a subculture or culture? I, 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 don't, I would yeah. call it a subculture, mm. and that's basically what I wrote about. Um, mm. You know, I think uh, I, on my blog, I will be putting up my previous writings for the KC and other stuff, and that's what I wrote about. You know, this uh, it's a... You know, it was a British English and initially a London subculture started by the North London Jewish population, essentially largely in the late 50s, which grew into, you know, the mods and rockers that we all know. And that was transported to Japan, probably by the jam touring here in, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s and was adopted. And you know what Japanese people are like? If they get into something, they get into it to the nth degree. So I went to this Mods Mayday event down at... Um, down in the bay there, I can't remember the name of the venue. <clears throat> and you basically had groups of people that represented the whole of uh, the original mod subculture from the late 50s. So some people were quiffs who were, you know, ardent R&B rarities collectors. Uh, and these, these guys that I met that um, had these uh, amazing scooters, you know. Um, and it was a real eye opener. I mean, it was quite bizarre, but it was great, you know. And there was a, a pub, a bar opened up in Kyoto called the Weller's Bar, uh, which I found oh. during, when I was researching that and um, went along there and, and some of these mod guys came along on their scooters and stuff. And that was great. So that uh, got written up in Mojo magazine. So that was really good. So the writing, uh, you know, writing was always something that I'd had an interest in. And um, I wrote a book about the World Cup in 2002, which was published by SU Press, who published the Kansai Time Out. And um, it was something I considered going into for quite a while, actually, uh, but made the decision not to. Um, this will probably come up when we start talking about starting the school and franchising. Uh, but I was doing all of that, writing here in Japan. So I arrived in 95, um, started writing in 98. Uh, around about the same time, I quit my last job and started my first school. So I was doing the two things parallel for a while. But uh, yeah, the only writing I do really now is on my blog, and I haven't been very active on my blog for quite a long time either. So I need to restart that. Okay. So I... I... I haven't read your book. Sorry about that. I, I just uh, found out about it today. <laughs> it doesn't, but... doesn't put you in a very exclusive group. Though, right? <laughs> okay. You know, the interviewers should read all the books, but like <laughs> Alan Partridge, I never read the books. But <laughs> um, but it, it says, it, it is very interesting subtitle. It says nationalism versus internationalism. Yeah. Well, what's, what's that about? Well, the idea of the book was uh, obviously it's a, it's a kind of travelogue through Japan via the World Cup. And, um, you know, there's that famous all world quote about sport being war minus the shooting, you know, and um, if anything represents um, cheerful nationalism, it's sporting contests, you know, and so I wanted to look very briefly um, at sort of those conflicting ideas, you know, Japan is always talking about internationalism and the World Cup was a great opportunity. Um, like the Olympics were, you know, in the 60s, like the Osaka Expo was in 1970 um, and uh, the World Cup in 2002. Um, you know, the modernization and the internationalization of Japan. So it was looking at those two conflicting things and how it would play out. Now, of course, 
coming from England, um, and if anybody reads the book, they'll realise that I'm not actually that ardent uh, fan of the England football team. But coming from England, we have a terrible reputation of being hooligans. And this was a big concern for people. So how is it going to play out? Were they going to be met by the nationalists in the sound trucks, asking them to revere the emperor and driving the hairy barbarians back? Or, and, but actually, it, it was an international festival of uh, fun. And uh, there wasn't, uh, I think... Uh, the quote on the cover is something like there wasn't a single arrest for a public order offence during the 2002 World Cup. So it was that idea of looking at somebody's drive, what, how, you know, um, how much does nationalism drive them to support their team? And then how does that play against this international mix? So, you know, England got to play Argentina. We get the Falklands War all over again on, on the football pitch, you know, and... Um, stuff like that. Uh, Japan played Russia. There's, there are territorial conflicts between uh, Russia and Japan as well, you know. So uh, looking very briefly at those, it was more a travelogue around Japan, looking at the football and uh, sampling beer, really. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's available on Amazon and you can contact me directly for a signed copy. And what's the name <laughs> of the book again? Uh, we Are Nippon. We Are Nippon. Okay. Yeah, which is one of the chants that the Japanese fans were singing. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to move on to kind of more teaching things here because this mm. podcast, I'm sure we, we could do a Joe Rogan here at three hours. But um, <laughs> uh, so tell me how you got into teaching and mm. uh, what started that? Well, I, th I think I've said this before, you know, I, I kind of arrived in Japan in the spirit of a fruit picker, really. Um, I'd been traveling um, for a bit before that. I had about two and a half years when I was in uh, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and back to England, and then came over to Japan. And the idea of uh, being uh, an EFL teacher was that it would give me a portable skill to allow me to travel uh, and see more of the world, particularly uh, more of Asia. I was very interested in spending more time in Asia. I spent quite a long time in Australia and New Zealand, which you know is former parts of the British Empire, now parts of the Commonwealth. The culture is very familiar. Uh, obviously, in Thailand, it wasn't familiar at all. And in Hong Kong, there was a, this fantastic mix of Chinese, local Chinese culture and um, British, uh, British culture as well. So I was very interested in spending more time in Asia. I had these rather grand notions of uh, immersing myself in a foreign uh, country, culture and language. You know, it sounds ridiculous now. But, um, and so um, I, was, I was in England. It was cold and miserable. And I didn't have very much money at all. And um, I basically faced the choice of, was I going to do the CELTA, which would have taken up all of my money, or was I going to buy an airplane ticket and arrive with some money in my pocket? So I spoke to a few people I knew in Japan. And there are, so I didn't do the CELTA. So I just bought one way ticket and arrived in Japan in, I think, September 95. Um, managed to get a job and then realized pretty quickly that I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And so, there was a friend of mine at the time who had his Delta. He was a uh, trainer and materials writer for ECC. So I got him to basically run me through the equivalent of a CELTA. There was a few of us that did it. He was great. And that was fantastic. And um, yeah, so sort of uh, became a, a teacher at a private language school. That was kind of semi full time. Um, started getting private lessons here and there and slowly started getting into learning the language. Okay, so you started off with the, it's kind of traditional route, isn't it? I mean, you probably know Ian Simpson and, and Peter Lackner. I do, know, Lackner, I do but, know Peter, yeah. Sure. And, you know, I've interviewed before, and uh, I think uh, what uh, Ian came as a, a high, high school teacher, and right. he, he started his own enterprise here. Yeah. But, you know, like a lot of people that come to Japan, it's, mm. you know, you start in Eikaiwa with private yeah. language school and right. you, you kind of develop from there. So that, you, was, you... that was me. Yeah, mm. that was me for sure. Yeah. You know, and at that time, I really had no ambitions uh, of anything at all. You know, I was only 27 or 28 or something and didn't really have any ambitions at all. And I just thought it might be a laugh. You know? mm. And what happened then? You you decided you were a little bit underqualified. You didn't really know what you were doing. So you decided mm. to get more seriously into... Yeah, so yeah. going going through that training, um, and so that guy was doing like a basic private uh, TESOL certificate. So doing that just put a completely different... Uh, just made me such a much better teacher. And um, that meant that I, I was doing a much better job. I was never super, super confident with very young learners. Um, didn't have much experience with kids at the time. Uh, and I think that's one of the one of the problems with the industry here is that people will be recruited because of their native language or their nationality. 
and their you know degree qualification and uh, minimum training are thrown into language classrooms and they haven't got a clue what they're doing really yeah uh, and um, and so then I did a, another T certificate after that and I think I worked at that school for two and a half years or something like that and um I had quite a few private lessons and uh, uh, here and there and I just uh, I I was just fed up with being an employee I think I just uh, fancied uh, doing my own thing and so I did and this all co- sort of coincided with there was the there was the France World Cup in 1998 I quit my job in May of that year and then I started writing my first article for the Kansas Time at around about the same time, I think, you know, and, and quit my last job and started just teaching from home. Um, you had Dean Rogers on here and he was talking about this the other day that, you know, if you can start with, uh, if you can start with the base uh, of students that you're already teaching, um, it's certainly going to be easier for you to branch out into a school if that's what you want to do. And I had that through my, through my private students, you know, so I was teaching at home and um in a spare room in my house and um laughingly now looking back at it i used to do everything i used to a friend used to help me write the copy or would advertise on a local magazine uh pado for those that know it and i would answer the telephone and do the initial sales calls in japanese and i don't know how i had the nerve to do it quite frankly it was uh my japanese is obviously much better now but i wouldn't answer the phone now to a sales call no way you know but I was, I guess I was driven because I had to do it. There was nobody else around. So it was backs against the wall. Backs against the wall, yeah. Yeah. You know, actually, very quickly, I, I had a very decent income very, very quickly um, and a very nice sort of uh, timetable, um, working from home, cycling to a few places, and I think it was a couple of jobs I used to go and do on the train. So I was kind of like, uh, you know, independent teacher, uh, a grammarian gun for hire, I think is how I termed it in one of my blog articles <clears throat> and um that was it was very very simple setup did everything myself um collected fees in cash <laughs> sometimes we cycling around with like 300,000 yen in an envelope and i uh, thought yeah actually this is possibly something i could do you know so but I, only I, in japan could you do that could you feel well safe? i wonder you know yeah. I, I know mm. i mean the the pay, the the pay might be different i don't know but i know plenty of people who've done that say in spain or italy who've set up their own thing there as well you know um, in terms of the safety aspect, possibly, yes. Mm. But again, at the time, you know, I wasn't really thinking seriously about this. Uh, it was, um, I'd made the decision not to be employed anymore because I just wasn't happy and I became self-employed and that was quite good. I, at the time, so 98, you know, late 98, um, I, I didn't know whether I was going to stay in Japan or not at that time. So, um, yeah, it wasn't wasn't like I planned a massive franchise organization from day one. But we don't have, and we don't have a massive franchise organization. So I achieved that on plan. It's often people who plan big things don't end up with them, but people who plan small things, you know, they they end up growing exponentially, don't they? I mean, I was reacting to my situation, and I could see that there was potential um, to do to do other things and so come 1999 I got married moved out of the apartment I was in converted that into three classrooms took on other teachers and staff and again really wasn't really thinking much about expanding then uh, one of my former students uh, did some admin and reception work for me hired an Australian teacher and um, hired people to do the kids classes really because I wasn't very confident uh, teaching very young learners and um sort of did that for a while and then the opportunity came up to uh get involved with uh somebody else and and run a branch so we did that for a while and um it wasn't a complete disaster but i didn't enjoy it and um it, logistically there were a few problems with it it was geographically quite close to uh, what became the head school but in terms of the train lines you had to go sort of via hexam as it were uh, which nobody will get that reference, but basically you had to go into it. You had to go into Kyoto. Kyo- no, <laughs> ignore <laughs> it. Ignore it. It's uh, you basically had to had to uh, because it was like over some hills and it wasn't there wasn't a direct uh, train line. You had to go into Kyobashi and change and go out again. So it was quite a difficult and expensive route. So it wasn't as flexible to set, have teachers teaching in two locations as I'd hoped it was. And uh, I can't remember exactly what happened. Nothing bad happened, but I didn't particularly enjoy that. I didn't particularly enjoy. Um, 
employing those teachers and I didn't particularly enjoy having a partner. There's nothing wrong with him. He was a good guy. Um, and I think the lease came up on the, on the premises and we, and it wasn't doing particularly great. And so we just decided to cut our losses. And from then, basically, I kind of decided that I didn't want to have branches. I didn't really want to have branch schools. So this is probably at this time, if this would be maybe early 2000, I guess, I, I would have to check the dates. And so I just continued doing the freelance writing and building up the school. By this time, the Korean school had moved into a premises near the station. We had three classrooms, a couple of receptionists. And I think we moved in there late 2000, early 2001. And we had like 25 students join in January 2001 or something. And it was just, it was a very good time to open a school. Um, and that really took off. And all of a sudden we were, we were, really really busy um at that head school and so i thought about opening uh, another branch and then i remembered my uh, earlier experience with branches and decided not to do that um was very involved with a cancer time out at the time and, and then wrote the book and then so doing the book in the summer of 2002 i took a couple of months off about three months off i think uh, maybe two to do prep for the book and then four weeks traveling around japan uh, going to the World Cup, I was very lucky. I got a press pass from FIFA. And so I attended, I think, 14 games or something like that. And then wrote that up. So it took me six weeks to write the book. So I was back teaching at this point. So I was, I'd get up in the morning, do some writing, go to school, do teaching, stay at school, do more writing, um, writing full on the weekends. So that was a very, very busy time. And during um, the travel for the World Cup, I got to know uh, a lot more journalists. And um, there was a friend of mine who was at the Daily Yomiuri at the time that said, yeah, come down to Tokyo, I'll get you a job at the Daily Yomiuri. And uh, I just didn't fancy it. You know, it was, um, I don't know if you know much about uh, the Daily Yomiuri. I don't particularly like the newspaper and its politics, but um, the, the, the entry-level job is basically a rewriting job. So you get the translated stories and, and have to rewrite them. And it didn't, didn't seem particularly interesting. <laughs> a lot of journalists I met are very cynical. And uh, Yeah, <laughs> I find ju just thing about the, the articles, I've, I've read some of the Amiuri articles. They, yeah. They're directed in, 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 or they're translated in, in a Japanese way. They don't mm. read really well in English, in, in my opinion. They, a lot of them don't. I mean, if yeah. it's the translated stuff, a lot of them are not that great, you know. But then, so th this other friend, he, be he became a features editor, so he commissioned his own um, his own section. That was really, really good. Lots of music and, and culture and stuff. That was actually a really, really good uh, section. <clears throat> but I basically made the decision that I didn't want to become a journalist, uh, not, uh, not a print journalist anyway. I still enjoyed writing, but I didn't want to become a print journalist. So I guess I made that decision um, in 2002 and decided to concentrate on the business. And we opened up our first franchise in April 2003. Okay, so I wanted to go back a little bit. There's a, sure. a few things I, I want to touch on there. And, and the, the first one was you had an aversion because you had a bad experience of, you know, branch school and something unforeseen happened mm. or something you, you hadn't accounted for. Basically, yeah. that it, the, the train lines were, as you said, yeah. hex, hexamed or, you know, <laughs> there's a hexam situation. Yeah, um, Alawa hexam, yeah. Yeah, that, that's it's kind of very similar, to, I, th I think, to a lot of entrepreneurs or people mm. that uh, they encounter these things. And I, I feel this myself in that, you know, mm. we're uh, running a co conference on tef um, TOEFL teaching in right. August. Just right. a bit of a plug there. But yeah. of course, I'm doing most of the stuff. So I have to do all the, you know, commission the speakers and mm. uh, organize and advertise. And of course, I have. Uh, interns are putting in some great help but the fear is i'm going to miss a lot of things yeah you know i'm like the stuff there that it's just going to be a disaster because i'm i didn't pick up on this part that part mm. is that how you felt it was like i'm going to start a school and there's something i'm missing and it's a it's a kind of a underlying fear i have with that branch, it was already an existing school and it was advertised for sale. So I went along to have a look at it and um, I'm not sure if I would have chosen that location, but that, that was by the by, really. Um, speaking to the owner, uh, we came up with the idea of a modern English branch. And so the location was already set. I didn't choose the location. Mm. I think naively, I thought it would have been easier to send teachers between the two schools than it actually was. Um, we had a little bit of difficulty with 
telephones. We weren't as uh, um, we weren't as well set up then uh, as we were now. But yeah, I mean, essentially, we were making it up as we go along. You know, I obviously took from what we were doing at our school and uh, applied it. Um, but yeah, realised that we certainly needed to be a lot more organised. Having a partner is not easy. It's not for everybody, I don't think. Um, like I said, there's nothing wrong with the guy at all. You know, we got on very, very well. But you know, you've got to ask if it's a 50-50 partnership and if anybody's listening, never go into a 50-50 partnership, at least at least to make, be a minority or a majority partner, one of the two. I'm, Probably, I'm in a 50-50 partnership. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it can be difficult. Well, the point is if you, if you disagree and you have to make a decision, what do you do? And so I've had uh, people who've part owned franchises before, and I've always said to them that um, I will only accept this if you have a if you nominate a referee that you will go to if you reach deadlock, mm. uh, because you've got to be able to move forward. You know, legally probably it doesn't make that much difference, but uh, personally you've got to be able to make a decision. Now I didn't really have um, that problem with that guy at all, um, but. <clears throat> I wasn't there at school every day and uh, didn't have the direct ownership of it that I did at my own school. And, uh, it, you know, um, there was nobody, there was nobody in ownership of the school who was out there handing out flies, for example, just to take one, one example. So it wasn't as easy to uh, manage as the one that was directly in charge of. So I think that was the thing with it. So the numbers, the numbers weren't increasing there in the way that they were at the other school and so you know the, the least i think it was the least came up we just decided to pull the plug so yeah so i certainly learned a lot from that and um, I'm, I'm glad it happened nobody didn't lose any money um didn't make any money but we didn't lose any money and uh, um i think the students all managed to find somewhere else to go uh the teachers uh, i was sending so they still had work with me um and but yeah it made me it made me think about branches and logistics and locations and all of that yeah for sure okay. the second thing i wanted to pick up on was training you know mm. this is uh this is a thing obviously you feel you feel strongly about because right. just looking through your pages, you want somebody at least to be Tesla qualified yeah. uh, to come in and work for you. Right. But, uh, you know, the argument is always there that teachers should be, you know, have Celta Delta. Mm. But my argument, as I put mm. to a lot of people putting forward this opinion is that it's quite expensive and teach, you know, being a teacher is not a lucrative posi uh, position, you know? Mm. So for example, when you're beginning, like you had, you had the choice between the flight and the, the yeah. CELTA. Now, some people have the luxury, you know, money and time and they can do the CELTA over the month and then take mm. the flight and, you know, everything's hunky dory. Mm. But, you know, if if you're in like a job that's sometimes not so well paid that uh, asking the teacher to pay for a training course is is quite difficult. Do you think the, the school should share the cost of training or at least provide good training for the teacher? We now only recruit teachers who are already qualified. Mm. Um, so that decision has already been made and that does a couple of things. I mean, there is a huge variety of uh, TESOL courses. Ideally, we would recruit somebody who had the CELTA or equivalent Trinity or TESOL Canada or something. And it's the practica there that I think that are the most valuable thing in that. Um, but if we are recruiting somebody who, for example, has the CELTA, they've already made that decision themselves. They've already taken it seriously and they're already invested in uh, their profession. And that's what we want to look at it as, as a profession. You wouldn't take somebody out of university and put them into an elementary school job as a teacher without having any teacher training or teacher qualifications. So, no, I don't think the onus is on... Uh, the employer to provide the training for the trainee to be able to do the job from day one. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, if you get going to get somebody to come around and plaster your house, you wouldn't pay for their plastering training, would you? Mm, sure. Um, I think for, for ongoing professional development, it's a completely different, um, completely different scenario for in the past. We have employed people uh, who've got a lot of, teaching experience good classroom experience they've been through our interview process and we've asked them to get a TESOL and then once they're TESOL qualified we increase their pay so they're motivated to do it most of those TESOL qualifications that people do, are doing are without practica and um, would be done online and there's a huge variety of some very very bad ones and some fairly decent ones so we ask for that minimum commitment for them to do that work on their own so they get the background knowledge which you could look up on Google anyway you know uh, and then we'll increase their pay and then we pay for them to do their practica if they don't have them 
And who could you recommend? What good names for, there for, for, for training for for your te- for teachers to to train? You said there's some good ones and some bad ones. For the certificates, I think mm. for the TESOL certificates, um, the ones that you can do online, I think TESOL Canada are very good ones online. Um, and this, if you you know you, you can you could buy one on Groupon for like two hundred dollars or something. It's not going to be worth uh, cheaper than that. I think fifty dollars. Yeah, right, now, yeah. right. Mm. But that's obviously not going to be worth very much at all. I think you know they've all got a bit of background in it. We have seen a couple where one of our uh, staff went through and corrected all the typos and the, and the grammatical errors. And you know there's some really really bad ones. TESOL Canada, uh, I think TESOL Org, the American organization, recommends some. The British Council have some great materials online. Um, Celsa and Trinity are probably uh, the benchmark and there are places you can do those here in Japan but yeah they, they are a bit costly um, but we, we will take somebody with uh, so we've just hired somebody who has a TESOL 160 hour TESOL certificate from uh, a college in LSC who have a relationship with TESOL Canada uh, she didn't actually do her practica but we're going to do her practica in house so we work with Celsa and Delta qualified trainers on a freelance basis and we, we can do in house practica and there are organizations in Japan that can do that as well if you look at ITDI for example uh, they have some some good training programs our um, friends in itdi itdi.pro so if you want to go to also that, a sponsor of oh, uh, <laughs> the the uh, the TOEFL conference coming up which right. is also a great uh, um opportunity for professional development as well so we've right. got some great speakers there. i don't yeah. actually mm. i don't actually know them uh, i've i met steve herder very mm. briefly in a bar um, I think the other guy is Philip Shigeo Brown. I don't think I've met him, but uh, Catherine Littlehill, who we used to work with and was the author on Happy Valley, she was involved with them for a while. So um, I'm sure they know their onions. I don't know what they do with very young learners, for example. And I think that's an area in Japan. Or it, I think that's an area in EFL generally that uh, needs better um, training and qualifications. For If we go back to talking about the CELTA, you know, the CELTA doesn't have a... Uh, an automatic young learners component so for example if you go to St Giles in London or somewhere to do your CELTA you can do an optional young learners certificate after that which is a very very good idea especially if you're going to be teaching in Asia Um, but I think yeah that's something that needs addressing I think standards generally need addressing in ELL Um, if uh, we used to have a, a part ownership of a school in Edinburgh in Scotland and if you, for example, if you want to be a host family, you have to go through police background checks because you could be dealing with children. And most schools uh, ask for a background check for their teachers as well. Uh, in Korea and China, um, teachers need a background check. In Japan, anybody can walk in to any job anywhere. They won't necessarily have any um, teaching qualifications and there's no requirement for background checks. So you could get an unqualified person in terms of teaching and you haven't checked their criminal background, and you be, you could throw them in with children aged six and seven the next day. That's already happening with Japanese teachers, isn't it? Some of them have uh, offences, and they're still teaching. I've, right. I, I read it a few months ago. but Right. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very lax. It is lax, and I think it needs addressing, you know. I think it needs addressing, I really do. Okay, so let's move on we, uh, to more about the, the business end of things. So your, your school, you decided you... You decided to centralize rather than decentralize. So you ha- you built up a big school, and then tell me about more branches and and moving to being a franchisor. How, so how, the, how idea the the idea with the the idea with the franchising was if it, so having looked at that experience with a branch, but then looking back at the experience I had when I went from a um, an employed teacher to a self employed teacher, all of a sudden once I was self employed, everything just meant so much more. Um, I like to think that I was a hard worker anyway and uh but it meant so much more when it was for me um uh, my work rate increased my attention to detail increased i looked after my students a lot more i like to like i say i like to think i did a decent job before a good job in fact before that but i think it's uh, inevitable that when it's your own uh, depending on your personality i suppose but um when it's your own it means so much more to you so the idea was to recreate that uh but support people in a way that i didn't have the support in 1998 when i was answering the telephone and, and doing the flyers uh, myself. So the idea was to help uh, foreign teachers run their own school to because they're self-motivated and I want them to be self-motivated. And I believe that um, everybody benefits when the person receiving 
uh, the student fees when they're as close as possible to the student in the chain, if you like. So if the teacher is receiving the fees from the student, there's a much, much closer relationship than if they're employed by a big organization. And it doesn't matter if, if the students leave. Um, but then to support foreigners do things they couldn't do, such as answer the telephone. So that was, that was the idea behind coming up with uh, the franchise. So we advertised uh, in the Kansai flea market at the time, which is uh, a, a free paper, uh, had, a, had an inquiry and opened up the first franchise uh, in April, March or April 2003. 2003, wow. So yeah. all, almost 20 years there. Yeah, it's what, so what, 2000, what is it, 2021? 20, 20, 2021 now, yeah. 18, 18 years we've been franchising, mm. yeah. So between 2003 and 2007, when I moved out of Osaka and moved into the house in Kyoto that we're in now, when, when I moved here, we opened two new franchises the same month that I moved, same week that I moved, in fact. It, it was a crazy week. And um, we have 14 schools at that point. Wow. Yeah, that was weird. That was very pleasing. I think you have to look at, um, you know, timing it plays a massive part, probably the biggest part uh, in, in launching any business. And that it was an incredibly vibrant market at the time, you know, from 2003, 2007, um, 2005, 2006, probably. Um, and at that point we didn't, we hadn't had a single failure and, um, yeah, we would open schools and they were successful. It was great. We had a great time doing all that. It was, it was really, really good. Wow. So you, you went from a failure of a branch school to having no failures. So it was, it was obviously a great learning experience. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I think it's important to highlight that. Uh, so this is at that time when we opened school number 14 in April 2007. We hadn't had a single failure. Uh, by the autumn of 2008, we did have our first failure uh, for, for a franchise. And um, I don't know if you remember that far back, but in, I think it was, uh, was it the August or the September of 2007, Nova went bust. Now, uh, there'd been a drop in the market before that, which uh, we had seen, um, but I don't think we'd anticipate how brutal it was going to be. And um, Nova went bust. There was uh, I mean, a lot, just to wind back a little bit further, a lot of people had ridden on Nova's national TV advertising. You know, they created a huge amount of awareness for everybody and everybody did well out of that. You can say anything you like about Nova. Um, I, I know some great teachers that came from Nova, and I know people that have learned to speak, speak English fluently at Nova. Uh, they get a bad rep as a, as a company from some people, but uh, they, they did a lot of good as well. Um, but then they went bust, and that created a terrible, terrible image of um, ACAR, private language schools. And I think it was either September or October of 2007 was the only month in history at head school in Korean that we didn't recruit a single student. Oh. And the world changed from then. The private language school world changed dramatically. Somewhere back on my blog, I've, I've got a graph and you can look at the figures and around then it goes off a cliff face. And estimates range between 40 and 60% of the top market was lost at that time. And so timing is such a, such a crucial part of it. So we'd, in the April of 2007, we'd opened two new locations, one in Uehomachi in Osaka and one in Motomachi in Kobe. The Kobe school was closed in a year and the uh, Uehomachi school still exists and uh, is, is doing really, really well. And so timing is, is crucial, but then obviously location is the thing after that. And then there's the person doing it. So what we always say, with the franchising is that by definition, the only things that are different between any franchise are the location and the owner, the person doing it. Uh, those are the only two things that are different. And so, well, the t the, and, and the timing, I guess, but <clears throat> so Motomachi was, I think the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time with hindsight and how much he survived because uh, it was a good location and a good owner. So you have to be aware of those things. You know, you, you just about location and timing, location and, and person uh, are the three key things. Okay, fantastic, because you've anticipated my next question. <laughs> so to be become a, a franchisee, where should you be? How, 
what what sort of person do you see as being the successful franchise? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question, you know, and we were less cautious about this than we are now when we, when we first started because everything was going so well. Um, and I think so the difference between somebody who wants to do everything themselves and, the, and, a, a, and a franchisee is somebody who wants to take advantage of a, pro a proven product or a proven system. They're still entrepreneurs. They still take the financial risk and they have to develop a business. Um, but opening up a franchise, whether it's a product franchise or a service franchise, and this is something that people should look into if they're interested. Um, you know, if you walked out, I don't, I'm not, well, you're in Tokyo, right? Tokyo, yeah. Just where about, Tokyo. Whereabouts are you? Uh, Nish Tokyo. It's right. uh, on the Seibu Ikebukuro line, kind okay, of near, right. near to Kurosawa, not so big. I can guarantee if you get off the train at your local station and you tap somebody in, on the shoulder and say, have you heard of modern English? They'll say no because we, we are not a national known brand, you know? So if you open a Lawson franchise or a McDonald's franchise, people know who you are. That's not what we offer, you know? So we offer, uh, we're a basic service franchise or, uh, or a, a teacher or an operator franchise. And so for a franchisee, you have to understand clearly the relationship between franchisor and franchisee. Both parties have to understand this. Um, and you want, the franchisee should be aware of what the franchisor is offering. In our case, the, the services that we provide, provide, they should be aware of their obligations and the franchisor's obligations, but they should be in a position or a mindset to take advantage of a proven product and implement it in an area that they choose, basically a location that they choose. And it saves you so much work in from starting from scratch. If you wanted to start a school from scratch, you've got to do everything from day one. You don't have a classroom. You don't have a curriculum. You don't have anything and you've got to do everything from scratch. So it's a, it's a huge time saver, but you also, as a franchisee, you also have to realize that you can't do everything that you want because the, the franchisor is going to have uh, requirements. Mm. Um, you know, can I change your logo to pink, for example? Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> I'm afraid it's a trademark. And then obviously in, in terms of operations, uh, because we operate a, a call center, uh, we run systems which are pretty prescribed and uh, if people don't stick to those they, they can go awry so we have requirements for people to act in certain ways you know, pretty simple directions to follow but if you're of the personality where you want to do everything yourself and you don't like being told what to do um, being a franchisee is probably not a, a good call for you if you realize that um, uh, a franchise could be a profitable enterprise for you as a teacher owner operator or you wanted to open multiple franchises and, and run those and you can see the value of, of the of the product and the services and look at it as a business well then it probably is a good decision for you okay so before deciding to become a, a franchisee uh so due diligence or yeah, americans right. say due diligence i don't know uh yeah. so what's the process there Take me through that. Yeah, I mean, so it, if somebody comes to us, you know, they, they've, they'll have seen one of our ads or they'll have heard about us somehow and they'll send in an inquiry. And it really is up to them to do their do due diligence on us. And they should uh, look at what we're offering. They have to make a decision whether it's right for them. For any franchisee, potential franchisee looking at any franchise or uh, ours or others, I would say that, you know, you want to be able to see the franchise agreement. Uh, you want a copy of that. You want to be able to go through it in detail. You want to be able to run it past a lawyer. You want to make sure that you understand what your obligations will be and what the franchisor's obligations um, will be. You should have clearly explained any questions that you have and be satisfied with the answers so that you understand them because there will be a declaration in the agreement that says that you've read it and you fully understand it. Um, if it was me, I would want to be able to speak to other franchisees um, and um, a franchisee should always write their own business plan as well. For a franchisor, you've got to make a decision on whether the person or the company that you're going to be working with is the right fit for you. And uh, we've learned uh, we've learned a lot about that along the way. Sometimes, uh, sometimes in 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 the hard way. Um, it's not for everybody, that's for sure. It really isn't. And what difficulties come up then in the in the relationship mm. between you know franchisor franchisee? Yeah, from the franchisor's point of view, you've really got to make sure that. The person has the right personality 
and that they understand the relationship and you have to be confident that you can both go ahead and develop this. Um, if the, if somebody doesn't want to follow the operations manual, if they want to do their own things and they don't want to consult head office on that, that is going to cause problems. Um, if, uh, a franchisee refuses to, for example, accept scheduling decisions that are made by head office. It's it's gonna it's gonna cause problems, and that has happened to us in the past. We had a very very bad experience with uh, one franchise about how long ago was that? I don't know, about fourteen years ago. And um, you know, we both did due diligence. Everything was looking pretty good. He was a, a aggressive uh, guy. Wanted to build up his school. Um, Everything, everything seemed good. I had a little indication in, in training when we we're doing the free trial training that things might not be as smooth as they could be because uh, we'd been through the free trial training with him and then he just disregarded that and did his own thing altogether. I, I thought at the time he was just trying to show off, which was okay. Um, but then we opened up and we, was get, we were getting loads of students. Uh, it, was, it was developing really well. And then, I don't know, he just seemed to, uh, he just, something seemed to, snap somewhere and he just started behaving in a very very uncooperative belligerent obstructive way in fact um and it became personal uh, to some of my stuff and then to me and he was just refusing to accept scheduling issues um wrote and told us that um he would refuse to accept this one woman coming for a lesson again at that time. This woman was eight months pregnant at the time, you know, but he was going to lock the door and not let her in. Um, and um, it was, it was really quite brutal. So we had to make a decision as to what we wanted to do, you know? So uh, we tried um, just going through the agreement and procedures and saying, well, this is what we agreed. This is what you didn't do. Ended up being letters from my lawyer and it, we just weren't getting anywhere. You know, disputes will can, can kind of grow uh, a personality of their own. And that's certainly what happened in this case. So we just made the decision that we couldn't do this anymore. Um, called him up for um, a meeting at our lawyer's office and told him that we were terminating the franchise agreement. Uh, we made him an, uh, an offer to buy him out, which was a very good offer at the time, which he, he refused. And then he emptied the school and ran away. We had to take it over. And then at the time, the franchise agreement had an arbitration clause in it, uh, which went to the uh, International Court of Arbitration in Lausanne, I think, in Switzerland. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Well, the idea of that was that it was, could all be done in English with one arbitrator in, in Japan rather than go through uh, uh, the Japanese courts. Um, so easier for two foreigners to, to work in English in that way. And then this, um, this case file from Lausanne arrived and it was um, inches thick. And, um, and in the end, um, we did settle. Um, we paid him less than half our original offer. Uh, we took uh, direct contract, uh, direct um, control of the school. We were running from head office anyway, sending teachers up there. And uh, we put a teacher in there from head office. And we sold it on later on. It's still in existence now. But it's an example of the wrong person uh, in the wrong organization. It wasn't good for him. It wasn't good for us. And it wasn't good for the students. Everybody lost, you know. So um, we certainly learned from that that we have to do we have to be very, very careful who we want to work with. You know, that's an extreme case, you know. That's a very, very extreme case. Um, but, you know, it can happen. And the, getting into the nuts and bolts of, mm. uh, of the relationship, how, how is risk managed? How is, uh, like, equity? Uh, tell me a little bit, your system, other systems or franchising? What, what sort of risk in particular? So, for example, in, in if... In this situation, if there's uh, insurance, for example, right. public uh, our, our professional indemnity, public liability insurance problems. Uh, or, basically, yeah, yeah, our contract requires all schools to have uh, liability insurance. You know, that's very cheap. It's, it's basically Duke insurance. It's only about ten thousand yen a month. That protects against accidents and uh, and. Uh, the like. I think it's important to realise that a franchisee is an independent business person and they use the services that, that we provide. So they have the entire financial risk 
for their own business. However, as a franchisor, we have a reputational risk as well. Um, obviously, we don't want uh, our franchises to fail. Um, um, I think with any business, you know, this, um, if you open, say, I don't know, say there was a chain of schools and they opened a new branch and within, within 12 months, if they, if they were still in the red, they weren't making any money after 12 months, it's time to pull the plug. You know, you're probably not gonna, gonna pull that one back. And that's what we did with our school in Watermatch. You know, we just, we just had to close it down because it wasn't ever gonna work. Um, so there's risk for everybody. Obviously as a franchisor, we want to run successful schools. So we, you know, we don't want to be seen to have um, a string of failures. We want to point to our successes. Um, so that's the risk from our point, the risk to our business reputation and our product and service reputation. Um, People have done things with our IP that we haven't been too happy about in the past, but that, that's usually uh, uh, able to sort that out. But for the franchisees and individual, you know, I would say do a business plan, uh, run it past the franchise or run it past a, a lawyer or a business consultant as well. And how realistic is it? How realistic is your business plan? If you're a teacher owner operator, you know, your biggest cost is going to be a rent. Your second biggest cost after that is probably going to be our admin fees. And then you've got marketing and utilities, and that's about it. So if you're looking to replace a, a teacher's salary, you want to earn minimum of 250,000 yen a month. You can add your rent and other expenses to that. You can look at the student fees and the makeup of the student body and work out how many students you need before you're going to get to that salary break even point. It's not a very difficult calculation, but you have to be realistic about your location and your marketing efforts as to whether you're going to get those students or not. And if you can bring students from the beginning, such as ones you've been teaching privately, either at home or at their houses or in cafes, uh, the more, uh, the more the merrier, really. Okay, so mo moving on to, we've talked a little bit about uh, the 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 type of person and the franchise franchise mm. or franchise. That's hard to say, isn't it? Franchise, franchise or, or franchise franchise or franchisee, yeah. Relation, yeah. FF relationship, maybe yeah. we could say. Uh, so we, we could talk about time, uh, location because this yeah. is something we touched on with uh, Peter mm. and e, uh, Peter Lackner and Ian Simpson right. in Japan also, and and of course Dean Rogers um, right. a, a few weeks ago. Yeah. So. Their experience was different. You know, Dean had say, a place, mm. you know, a few minutes from the from the station. Now, Peter Lackner would say that that's kind of with people working from home now that, mm. you know, you don't have to be so near to the station. So tell me a little bit about Well, location. it depends on what you want to do. I think that's the first thing. You'll be very, very clear about what you want to do. Now, you mentioned Dean again. Now, obviously, after they licensed uh, Rosetta Stone, that isn't going to work well. That is a, a name that is known. It's a brand that's known in Japan because of all of the work that Rosetta Stone had done uh, before Dean licensed it, you know. And so having uh, downtown locations makes complete sense for them. Um, in Ian's case, I mean, he's in, he might be near the station, but he's in a rural location, I think. Um, and it depends who you want to teach and what you want to teach them. You know, if you want to teach business people, um, you're probably better off being where the business people are. Obviously, post COVID, this is changing a bit. Uh, if you want to teach children, you're much better off being where the children are. And, you know, of course, some families live in the city center, but most don't. You know, most are in suburban or uh, commuter distance from from cities. And so you need to be sure of what you want to teach and then find out where those people are. And then you might find a great location. Then you need to look around the location, see what the competition is. The analogy I give is that, you know, private language schools, Zekaiwa, are pretty much, it's a very, very saturated market. And we're pretty much in the same position as a hairdresser. And so if you open up a new hairdresser in a town, you've essentially got to close another hairdresser, whether that's by taking um, a fifth of your business from five separate hairdressers um, or closing down one other new hairdresser. You've pretty much got to do the same to open an English school in, in a saturated market there are locations that will be untouched and um you know you might have a new town new development for example there's no english school there um, or you may find um a location that people are moving to now outside of tokyo so if you look at places in chiba and saitama uh, uh people are, are moving out of tokyo to to live further out and this is post-COVID because of uh, changes in uh, work-life arrangements. People then talk about the opportunities for online. Online certainly does open up some opportunities. And one of the opportunities it uh, brings up is the fact that now you've got to compete with everybody else in the whole world. 
And that's not an easy thing to do, you know. Um, we ran up until about six or seven years ago, we had an offering of uh, lessons via Skype. And we had qualified teachers here in Japan or and we worked with a client supplier in the Philippines as well. And it's such a low margin business that it's a it's a massive, massive volume business. We just didn't have the reach to get the volume to, to justify that. So online certainly provides some opportunities, but I think it's, you know, for example, if you opened up a, a bricks and mortar school downtown in Shinjuku, you've got a lot of competition not only competition of other schools, but you've got a lot of competition for attention of your potential students, you know, that have been distracted by lots of forms of advertising. That's more the case online, that there's so much competition online. Um, so, yeah, opening up an online school might be very, very difficult, unless, you'd, unless your uh, products and services are very, very different to everybody else's. And in English language learning, I really don't think that exists. And for anyone who doesn't live in Japan, uh, talk about hairdressers. Uh, there are a lot of hairdressers in Japan, even in small villages. I yeah, think there, there is. are. Yeah. And dry cleaners. And dry as cleaners. Well. Yeah. well, everybody needs a haircut and everybody needs clean clothes. The fact is that not everybody needs English. And this is mm. possibly more interesting to people outside of Japan than it is. And in, in that, although it's a big market, Japan is the only country in Asia where there is no correlation between English ability and earning ability. So... The type of English that um, parents want for their children, for example, uh, would be very different possibly than they would in Spain or Romania or somewhere. I don't know where most of your listeners are. Where are most of your listeners? Well, US. I, I, oh, really? All over US, UK, Spain. There's a, there's a big India. need for, there's a big need for uh, English in the US, right? But it's mainly ESL rather than ESL. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what, you 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 went into a, a lot of areas there. We we talked about time, of course. Yeah. Coming on to the third part was was timing and yeah. uh, with with COVID and coming out yeah. the other end. And yeah. we we talked about uh, online teaching, and this is something yeah. we've touched on with uh, Rob Howard, and right. um, we also. Uh, I think with Dean as well, talking right. about, you know, the Filipino schools. Yeah. When we say Filipino schools, is the teachers are all in the Philippines, aren't they? Like, yeah. for example, DMM. So for people right. who don't live in Japan or, or don't take English lessons online, it's mm. uh, the, it, what what do people pay? Maybe three, four thousand yen, which is about thirty, forty dollars a month for I mean, there's a huge unlimited vari- lessons. The, yeah, yeah, there's a huge variety of different sort of offerings. You know, rare job DMM are probably the two biggest uh, rare job. Uh, it seems to me, you know, they made no money for such a long time. You know, they, they do now. They've, they've turned a profit, a public listed company. Anybody can go and look at their results. But um, they made no money for such a long time. And they were they were initially really only a teacher student matching service you know connect with your teacher in the philippines via skype and use a copy side by side it was basically what they were doing so they were selling cheap lessons but they were selling essentially um as many lessons as you like in it uh for five thousand yen a month or something but they essentially took the old nova uh, approach to this so nova for those that don't know used to sell a huge bunch of tickets up front and the more tickets you bought uh, the cheaper they were, and then you could exchange your tickets for lessons, and you could take as many as you like. Sorry, Simon, just mm. stop you there. Sorry for interrupting you, but for yeah. people who don't know Nova, we, you know, we uh, just give you a little bit of background of their, their Nova were and still are, I suppose, in much in much more reduced circumstances, a national uh, ch- chain school, um, often derided, but not necessarily always fairly, I don't think. But so their business model was sell uh, ticket packages up front and use those tickets to take lessons and rare job uh were doing the same i haven't looked at their website for a while but they were doing the same now nova had something like a 12 or a 14 percent take up rate on the tickets that they sold so if you bought a hundred thousand yens worth of tickets you're only spending 12 to fourteen thousand yens worth and rare job were doing the same so nobody's going to take eight lessons a day well, one or two people might. But Some then, people, you know, they, they binge, don't they? It's like I want to take like 40 lessons in like a month or something. But there'll yeah. be a very, very small amount. <laughs> mm. and some will take none. And I think that, seriously, I think the take-up rate for Nova tickets is somewhere between 12 and 14%. I would imagine that Rare Job is the same. So, you you know, even though it looks like you might get... So they translate that into their pricing as being 100 or 200 yen per lesson 
a dollar or two dollars per lesson, which is not the real cost. Um, but it's, it's interesting, you, isn't mm. it? The, the twelve and fourteen and the the take up because mm. it, it kind of caters. I, I I think we've we've all done this. You know, studying. You know, we want to study more Japanese or other mm. languages, and and for people who study English as well, it's always the people are like, yes, now I'm going to like really do it, and mm. there's kind of a mania, and you're like, I'm going to buy all these tickets, going to do right. all this, and then you're like, within the, it's like a gym membership. Gym membership within yeah, a week, it's, you're just yeah. That's or, a, it. or a Udemy course. I've got two Japanese Udemy courses still to complete that I bought last year. Oh, you know? don't remind me about Udemy <laughs> courses. <laughs> um, that's what I should be selling, perhaps. But um, but I think that's the thing with Rare Job, and that's how they got to their pricing of 100 or 200 yen per lesson. And there's just no way you can compete with that unless you have volume. So going back to Dean, you know, he had his schools, he rebranded as uh, Rosetta Stone. Then uh, they got involved with Lincoln Motivation. They put them into all their centers. They got massive volume. And I think now that online is a bigger percentage of his volume than face-to-face in the classrooms. But they couldn't do that without Rosetta Stone and without the reach that they got through Link Motivation and, and, and their network. You know, it's a massive, massive reach. DMM, you know, for those that don't know, a pornographer turned uh, English language school provider, they've got massive reach. You know, and who knows what sort of English they teach in those lessons. But um, and red, red job grew very, very slowly and were in the red for many, many years. Um, but they were they were obviously an early adopter timing. They were very early into that space. I For, for us, for now, the online space is far, far too crowded for us to uh, to get into. it. We provide a, a hybrid or or an online service. We built this into our uh, online scheduling system um, for lockdown. So people can take our lessons as hybrid or online if they choose to, but it's not something that we actively advertise um, because people will go elsewhere for cheaper options. And I never want to get involved in a race to the bottom, you know, and I don't have the reach to get involved in a race of volume, you know, Um, you know, the whole one coin English idea seems like a lot of work to me. Okay, if I, a shout out to Tyson there, who I interviewed <laughs> a few weeks ago, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, you, if you, if you want to learn about OneCoin English and uh, this model, please uh, listen to that podcast. Yeah, and, and actually, I mean, uh, one when I say it, I mean OneCoin uh, as the generic price point term, not referring to um, Tyson's company, which is a, a very good company. So um, can uh, lessons learned in in japan business in japan is there parallels or can it be applied to other countries i mean you don't have schools in other countries so it's unfair so what kind of not anymore we we did we did we did have a share in a school in edinburgh um, ah, I did uh, read that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Taiwan as well. Is that right? I know we work. We work with people oh, in Taiwan, okay. but we, we do don't. We, we don't have any schools there. <laughs> um, yeah. the, so the Edinburgh School would be a fairly standard sort of school in Britain that uh, was hit by a triple whammy, really, oh. which mm. was um, change of visa regulations, uh, Brexit, and COVID. The visa regulations had meant that the British government uh, were no longer issuing essentially pathway visas. So people would go and do a year's study to get their IELTS or their TOEFL score up and then go on to university from there on a pathway course. But uh, the government changed the visas so that, for example, people from the Middle East, which was a big part of the market, they would have to go back home and then reapply for their visa to get into university. You know, under Theresa May, the British government brought in these uh, terrible, terrible restrictions on people entering the UK and the uh, what was the environment of um, I don't know discord or something that she wanted to create she certainly did it and that meant that all of those students went to Australia or Canada or somewhere that wasn't so xenophobic so that was the first thing but it was possible to pivot then to providing summer camps which is a big part of that industry as well and that was we were working with people in Taiwan sending um, uh, students over from Taiwan and we're starting to cultivate relationships with uh, uh, Chinese providers as well. It's a huge business. Uh, then um, Brexit comes along and then COVID hits and that, that saw off the Edinburgh School, basically. Unfortunately, it closed down and uh, the, it delisted the company. So that was a shame. Uh, for other private language schools, obviously, I've, I, know, uh, I know people in Taiwan who run schools. The difference in Taiwan is that they only go to school till about two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, Bushiban is the name of the schools in Taiwan, which is equivalent to Aikaiwa. 
Um, but the students of English in Taiwan will go three or four times a week and they'll have a lesson with a local teacher followed by a lesson with a, a native speaking teacher. And the first time I, I observed operations in Taiwan, it's just like their English is just so much better than kids in Japan who naturally, you know, if you only get 50 or 60 minutes contact time a week, um, you're, not, you're not achieving as much, you know. And I think this, going back to what I was saying earlier on about uh lack of correlation between uh, English ability and earning ability, it's not really taken seriously in Japan. It's taken seriously for, say, Aiken or entrance exams. But in terms of it being a skill that you're going to need uh, in your working life, for most people, at the moment, it's not taken that seriously. So, you know, private language schools are for elementary school kids and up are much in the same space as swimming and piano and other, other hobby activities, you know. Um, so in Spain or Italy, for example, um, the kids are going to benefit more by being able to speak English in their careers, no doubt about it. Um, and I think people in China and Korea feel similarly. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know much about that. No, but, you know, certainly in Spain, you wouldn't get a job if you didn't have a CELTA. Nobody would take you on. Uh, they all use Cambridge um, uh, materials. They all take uh, Cambridge assessment tests um and it's uh, it's a much uh well it's, it's a, an industry that's developed in different ways i think so I, I can't i've never run a school in spain really so i obviously can't talk about that but if anybody wants to try <laughs> do get in touch i would love you know i would love to apply the teacher owner operator model to europe i would love to do that we could have a call center in europe and people running their own schools that'd be great do we have a we have a good riff going on here because you're anticipating all my questions. So <laughs> about you know your 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 franchise in in, in Japan and uh, where else are you? Did just to mention again? Oh, we only have schools in Japan at the moment. Okay. We, we we did have one uh, a share one in the UK on the publishing side. You know we we work in uh, Japan, Taiwan, uh, a little bit in China and the EU. And um, we're keen on, on, on building that out. I'd be very, very keen to speak to people who wanted either us to help them with franchising their schools outside of Japan or for us to take our brand into countries outside of Japan. I would love to hear from people about that. OK, just pause for one moment on that, because I, I we, we haven't mentioned it all and we're kind of running out of time here. But mm. uh, the, as, as things go, but yeah. uh, Happy Valley, yeah. your publishing company and your writing. Tell me about that. Happy Valley came about because uh, we didn't have a uh, kindergarten uh, course and I really did not want to write one. We'd just written our in-house eight-level general English adults course. And so through a friend, I was introduced to Catherine Littlehale, who um, is in Japan and um, had a, has, has a career here, has her master's in uh, TESOL for young learners from York in England and um, took her on for what I thought was going to be a short consultancy so she could help put together a young learners curriculum, very young learners curriculum for us, up, kids up to the age of six. And basically through conversation with her, I realized that I didn't want an amalgamation of things that were available off the shelf. So uh, we, uh, we made Happy Valley and it's brilliant. And um, so that's, so we used that, we tested that in house for a couple of years and then we, we published that, I think 2012. Uh, that's now licensed in Taiwan and the EU, and um, we're hopeful. We have been hopeful for quite a few years of something in China, but really quite hopeful at the moment. And uh, that was a, that was a lot of fun. That was very creative. That was great fun. So I did I did the initial art direction on that, invented the characters. I wrote a lot of the music for that. Um, I say music; it's just kind of little little jingles, really. Um, but that was a, it's you know, a race track in Hong Kong as well as in Happy Valley. Is yeah, that true? A, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. It's, mm. it's a racetrack named after a cemetery in Hong Kong. Oh, but there are lots of Happy Valleys everywhere. I named it after a place in Northumberland that we used to go to, having completely forgotten about the Happy Valley in Hong Kong. Um, but mm. they, there you go. Yeah. And, but that was a that was a massive team effort. I think about fifteen people uh, worked on Happy Valley. It was a big, big effort, very big undertaking uh, financially and uh, in terms of work. Uh, but it's paid off and we're very, very happy with it. Great. And I just want to, about, about the future. So we, yeah. we touched on that, uh, expanding your franchise. So there's a couple of things I want to, is sure. about you and your future. And if you were starting out again, or for people who are looking to maybe expand their school, turn the school into a franchisee or become a franchisee, 
there's a kind of a cannonade of uh, questions. There, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so can you give me some tips? If there? I was starting out again, I would have stayed in IT. I studied computer science at university, didn't particularly enjoy it, but I enjoyed the problem solving. But the applications weren't particularly interesting at the time. It was kind of like payroll and that sort of stuff. IT now you know, run, runs the world. You can do anything you like in IT. You know, it's, um, I'm, I'm 53 now. There's no way I'm going to get reskilled in, I don't know, writing, I don't know, games in Unity or Ruby on Rails or something, you know. Um, I would have stayed in IT. That's, that would, that's what I would tell my younger self. Um, if you're starting, if I was starting out now um, and I want to start my own school, I would certainly look at franchising, absolutely, because it would just make things so much easier. Uh, cut so many corners that actually cut corners is not a good way to put it it would save you so much time so much work um i think if somebody wants to do their own school on their own they should get as much advice as they can from other people with the caveat that you know with all small business owners which is what independent school owners are everybody's got their own way of doing things because that's the way they want to do things so it's not necessarily going to match what, what you would want to do um but in terms of timing I honestly don't think now is a good time to open a new school. Uh, we don't know how COVID is going to play out in Japan. Is there going to be an Olympic strain or, or an Olympic wave? Seems inevitable to me that there will be. Is there uh, going to be an Olympics? Well, we won't go into that. Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's another yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah. And then, but so just assuming you could square all of those um, circles, or do we circle the square? I can never remember. Um, location is going to be the thing that's going to determine whether you're successful or not. You've got to decide who, who, who do you want to teach, what do you want to teach them, and where you're going to put it. You've got to do your location searches. And it's not as easy as uh, the, the old um, adage used to be, like, go and have a look where are the elementary schools, because that's where the students are. Well, there are lots of empty elementary schools in Japan as well, you know, and the population is moving because of COVID, so it's not that simple. Uh, we, we do uh, location searches, and we have, we have ways of doing them. Uh, which I'm not going to give away. The secrets sure. do. <laughs> Wouldn't expect you to, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if you want to anticipate, uh, I think, if you want to anticipate what's going to be a more vibrant market in the future, I think you've got to look at general, if, you, if you're teaching children or you're involved with uh, ch children at all, I think you have to look at general provision of after-school care for children. That will involve English and other things. So many, for, for those that aren't in Japan, so many kids have so many after-school activities like piano and swimming and climbing, whatever else it is. The people that provide, the one-stop shop that provides everything for double working families of which there are many, many more than there used to be even only 10 years ago, I think those places uh, will succeed. You've seen, for example, like my gym has become, has become popular. You know, if you could combine a gym and a swimming school and a music school and an English school and a climbing wall and do interdisciplinary stuff, in Ian Simpson has done something similar, hasn't he? Sport English, what he's doing, yeah, with the yeah. gym and the English. Yeah, I, I don't know that, that much about that. I haven't spoken to Ian for a while, actually. Um, he's often got a new project on the boil, Ian. Yeah, I'm always talking to him about new stuff he's doing. He's <laughs> yeah. uh, he's always uh, keeping up on things. But so, I, I, th I think those sorts of locations are going to do. Uh, uh, better in more densely populated locations. I mean, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, that's where I would start those. But that's a massive, massive, massive investment to start something like that. But sure. I think th those sorts of places are going to win. I also think there's a huge threat to uh, private language schools as, as they exist at the moment, as English is taught more in elementary school, um, for those that don't particularly need it, um, in terms of general English fluency, uh, schools are going to be providing this before too long, um, so, which leaves us with test prep, ACHEM. And, you know, that's much better off being taught by Japanese teachers than it is foreign teachers, I believe. Okay. The, except the, for uh, TOEFL, of course, for the people for TOEFL, who will, who for will TOEFL. be attending the TOEFL <laughs> conference. <laughs> the analogy, <laughs> that, the yeah. analogy that I use for that is that, you know, uh, I'm against testing generally but that's you know idealistic um i took my driving test which is a very useful test to take because it allows me to drive a car but nobody is born a natural driver there's no such thing as a native driver uh there are good and bad drivers obviously but driving instructors themselves didn't used to be drivers learned to drive passed the test and then learned to become driving instructors and those are the people that are good at getting people through the tests mm. and i think it's the same for academic tests 
Yeah, it's a good analogy, I think. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, yeah, excellent analogy, uh, Mr. <laughs> Blogger. But um, uh, yeah, so the future about your franchise, we'll just kind of wrap it up. Uh, yeah, your, we've yeah, been, doing, we've been, been doing a bit of reorganization. And, uh, you know, actually, we would love to take on uh, new franchisees. And uh, we basically, you know, if we look at, we've talked about branches, if we look at affiliates and franchises as well, you know, we have uh, two or three affiliates, which are essentially schools that don't have the modern English name, but use our services. And we can save those people a lot of uh, time and money as well. So we'd love to speak to people about that. And we'd love to speak to people about either converting their existing school over to an affiliate or a franchise or employing our services. We have an online scheduling and school management system called Live Schedule, which at liveschedule.net you can sign up for for free. And um, then you won't be able to know what to do with it. So get in touch after that. We'll help you set it up because it's quite complicated. It does a lot of work. It essentially does everything except teaching and making the tea. Really. Now I know because when you said send me your calendar availability, I'm like, uh, well, I just <laughs> I do the, the old system, but you're so far ahead with the, uh, what's it called? Uh, Calendly? I, I don't know. Calendly, I've used Calendly yeah, right. in the past, but it's kind of time zones kind of get, it, it takes a while to learn it. Yeah, so calend- bit, yeah. Calendly we don't use. I mean, mm. I'm basically, I'm for, for my own stuff, for stuff like this, I just use the uh, I just use the Mac calendar. But we have a thing called Live Schedule, which does scheduling and appointments and does makeups, and we can teach live via Zoom on that. It does financial uh, uh, stuff. It does CRM, marketing, all that. It's basically an online school management system. And so people can try that out free at the moment and would love to hear from people who want to do that and would love to hear from people who want to expand. And if there are people overseas, not in Japan, I would love to speak to people in different territories about expanding modern English outside of Japan. I, you obviously would need uh, local knowledgeable partners to do that, but I believe a lot of the services that we provide would be transferable to other markets because essentially you know, we put people into a classroom with a teacher. Okay, and the website is modernenglish, all one word, dot net. It, and, is in, it is indeed, yeah. And how are you contactable through the website? or what's through, the through, the, through the website, um, through my blog, which is morenactually.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn at Simon Moran. Uh, I'm on Facebook, although I don't look at Facebook a lot. And uh, we have a... Uh, Emmy Learning is kind of our parent brand, so emmylimited.com, which is... E-M-M-Y, is it? Emmy M-E-L, limited, oh, limited Emily. spelled okay. out, dot com. Yeah. But if you're feeling really brave and you want to talk about uh, business, why don't you just drop me a line at my email, simon at modernenglish.net. Okay. I will not, I will not reply to abuse. Uh, and you shouldn't. <laughs> um, Simon, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure, Philip, to finally chat to you. I've prattled on, as I normally do. Hopefully I'll have said uh, something of use to people. But, yeah, welcome people to get in touch. And thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out EFLmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.